where Paul was talking about advanced directives for treatment that you would or would not want when you become incompetent, I'm going to be talking about physicians actually participating in causing the deaths of their patients. So let me just give an outline of what I'm going to say this afternoon. I'm first going to go through terminology, the different kinds of physician-assisted death that there are, and say a little bit about whether those differences matter morally. I will give you the legal background, both in the United States and in um, those European and other North American countries where um, some version of PAD is legal. And then I'll go into the moral arguments uh, in favor of physician-assisted death, the arguments from autonomy, from suffering, and from equal protection. And then I'll talk about the, the moral arguments against legalizing physician-assisted death based on physician role or the impact on palliative care or the risks of mistake and abuse. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned uh, from the data from Oregon, which has now had physician-assisted uh, death for a number of years. And I will end with my, my own conclusions before we have questions and comments. So physician-assisted death covers both euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, or PAS. The preferred term in the US now is not PAS, but aid in dying. And indeed, I was chastised by the Director of Compassion and Choices for even using the term physician-assisted suicide. But in other countries, that term is still used, and indeed judges even in the United States uh, still use it. So sorry, Compassion and Choices, I still use it as well. The difference between euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide lies solely in terms of who administers the lethal dose in euthanasia the physician gives a lethal injection in physician-assisted suicide. The physician writes a prescription for pills that will kill the patient, and then the patient self-administers those uh, pills. Does the distinction between the two have moral significance? As I will explain later, Euthanasia is illegal everywhere in the United States. Physician-assisted suicide is legal in a few places. I don't think there's any intrinsic moral difference between the two, because in both cases, the physician has causal agency. Whether it's in writing the prescription that the person will take in order to end their lives, or whether it's actually giving the lethal injection um, himself or herself. There might be a pragmatic reason for preferring physician-assisted suicide to euthanasia, and it's this. If the patient has to actually take the pill, pills usually, and put them in her mouth and swallow then we know that she really wants to die better than if somebody else is injecting uh, the lethal dose into her. That would be the pragmatic reason for thinking that PAS is preferable. We can be more sure that it is genuinely voluntary. The person really wants it. On the other hand, there's a pragmatic reason against PAS, and that is what if someone who uh, is suffering terribly, terminally ill, wants to die, has a medical condition where they can't swallow? They're out. They can't get it. And I have to tell you, the Dutch think this is just crazy. Why should 
whether or not you are eligible for assistance in dying depend on something as seemingly irrelevant as whether you can swallow. So what is the definition of euthanasia? It comes from the Greek, uh, a beautiful death or a good death. And it has two aspects of it. It's causing the death of a person. That's one aspect. The other aspect is for the person's own good. And typically, it's used to relieve suffering that's considered to be unbearable, that cannot be otherwise ameliorated. We should make the distinction between voluntary and non-voluntary. There's also involuntary, but uh, I'll get back to that in a moment when I talk about the Nazi program. Voluntary euthanasia is where the person whose death is called requests to be killed. That would be voluntary. Non-voluntary is where the person doesn't have the capacity to request death. That could be infants. It could be the severely cognitively impaired. It could be those with senile dementia. There's a number of different kinds of cases that would come under non-voluntary. We have to understand the reaction to physician-assisted death in the context of the Nazi euthanasia program. Now, one of the ironies of history is that originally, euthanasia was limited to Aryans, so-called Aryans, suffering from incurable diseases, and Jews and other not Aryans were not considered uh, deserving of uh, euthanasia. But it soon became not something simply that was given to people who were suffering unbearably, but became a way to get rid of people who were considered undesirable or non-contributing to the state, useless eaters in that terrible phrase. And it was responsible for the deaths of, of many, many uh, handicapped children and uh, the mentally ill. And from there, it expanded to get rid of Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and uh, communists and other people that the Nazis just didn't like. Now, should we call this involuntary euthanasia? I think we should just call it murder, because there was no pretense anymore that it was for their own good, right? It was people they didn't want to have around. And it's important to remember this, I think, especially for those of you who are, not, who are too young to even remember anything about uh, World War II. This is the context in which people often uh, don't even want to use the word euthanasia, because it just brings up that context. Another distinction that's often made, although I think problematically, is the distinction between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia is killing the patient, and as I said, usually by lethal injection. What's been called passive euthanasia is withholding treatment in order to bring about the patient's death. I think this is the wrong comparison to make because there can be reasons for withholding treatment that have nothing to do with the attempt to bring about the patient's death. The patient may have refused life-sustaining treatment, may say, look, I wish I could live, but not at the price of that treatment. That's just too burdensome. It's not worth it to get another three months of life. I don't want that. Or it may be that the medical team says, we could do this, but it would be, it would be improper medically to do it and we're not going to do it. It would be futile, or it would be just imposing too much burden. So I think rather than talking about passive euthanasia, what we should say is there's euthanasia, which is where the doctor actively brings about the patient's death. And then there's the withholding or withdrawing of treatment, which may or may not be intended to bring about the patient's death, and may or may not be uh, appropriate 
depending on why treatment is being withheld. But I mention the term passive euthanasia because you may have heard it or will hear of it, and therefore I thought I should get it out on the table, even though I think it's bad terminology. Now, a little legal background. In most countries, physicians are not permitted to kill their patients. It is illegal for them to perform either uh, euthanasia or to give a prescription for uh, lethal drugs. In the United States, as I said, euthanasia is everywhere illegal, specifically by statute in the places that have uh, passed physician-assisted suicide statutes. Uh, physician-assisted suicide is now legal in Oregon. That was the first state to uh, legalize it. Washington, Vermont, and most recently, my state now of California, by statute. It had been rejected in California, and then this time it passed. In Montana, it's by court decision, although it's a little peculiar because it's a little bit in limbo. They haven't passed legislation giving guidelines, often thought to be very, very important for physicians to feel confident that what they're doing is really legal. In Canada, the Supreme Court has said that according to their fundamental sort of constitution, uh, it is violating C Canadians' fundamental rights to deny terminally ill patients who, sorry, not terminally ill patients, suffering patients who want to die to deny them physician-assisted suicide. So that passed in 2015, and I think it's actually already gone into effect in Quebec, and it will go into effect in the rest of Canada next year. Moving on to Europe, in the Netherlands, both euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide are legal, although most physicians prefer euthanasia to physician-assisted suicide. They consider it safer, more reliable than having to figure out the dosage of the drug. In Belgium, interestingly enough, euthanasia is legal, but not physician-assisted suicide. And in, in Switzerland, uh, either physician or non-physician assisted uh, suicide is legal if done without self-interest. And there, really, the doctors did not want to get involved, uh, but instead the argument for legalizing it was, well, if suicide is no longer a crime, which it isn't in most places any, anymore, how can assisting a suicide be a crime? That doesn't make any sense. Therefore. Yeah, but you don't have to involve doctors, uh, and that's uh, unique, I think, to Switzerland. So there, are very, very roughly and briefly, let me point out some of the salient features of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act, which has been the model for the other states in the United States that have adopted physician-assisted suicide. First of all, only competent and terminally ill patients are death eligible. Right? So before they will give you the lethal prescription, they will ask you, do you understand that this is going to kill you? Do you understand that when you take this, you're not going to wake up again? You have to be competent to understand that and make the request. And only those who are terminally ill, which is defined in the statute as uh, death will occur within six months. The person requesting the prescription must do it in writing and must do it twice over a period of two weeks. The physician must ascertain that the patient is competent. There is no requirement in the statute of psychiatric evaluation, which some have criticized. And also the physician must get a second opinion from another physician who is not involved in the patient's care, both that the patient is terminally ill and that the request is voluntary. The person really wants it, understands, is not being coerced. There are important safeguards in um, all euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide legislation. Uh, voluntariness is uh, one of them. 
Uh, it's un, uh, required in every state in the United States that allows it. And it's understood as meaning that the person is now competent, or what's called contemporary competence. By contrast, in the Netherlands, as the result of a fairly recent decision, the voluntariness requirement can be satisfied by advanced directive. So there was a case that Paul and I wrote about, about a woman who all her life was a proponent of euthanasia, and as she, as she had an advanced directive saying that she uh, did not want to go into a nursing home if she could, should, could, should become demented, and that she would prefer to die and would want euthanasia. As she became more and more demented, she was not able to contemporaneously uh, consent to that. But because she had the advance directive and the support of her family, who um, said that this is what she wanted, they did. Uh, it was legal for her doctor. They decided to have helped her to die. Infant euthanasia is allowed in the Netherlands in cases of unbearable suffering, so that's obviously not voluntary, if both parents and doctor are convinced there's no reasonable uh, alternative. Um, obviously, both of these have been quite controversial. The other safeguard is terminal illness, de death within six months, which is required in the US. Um, terminal illness is one of those things that it sounds good, but it has some problems. One of the problems is it's often difficult to diagnose death within six months. Medi uh, medical staff are very, very good at saying that someone is going to die in three days, right? <laughs> but not so much six months. So then the question is, are they just saying it because that's what you have to say? Or, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not really very, very clear. And it's not required in Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, or Switzerland. Switzerland is, very emphasizes autonomy. As long as you want to do it, they don't really care why. In the other places, uh, Canada, Belgium, and the Netherlands, the emphasis is on unbearable suffering. And part of the reason for this is if you restrict it to people who are terminally ill, understood as they'll be dead within six months, what about people who have progressive neurological illnesses, such as Parkinson's or ALS, and they may not be going to be dead in six months? So you just they can't get it until they're in the last six months of their life? It's, that seems kind of arbitrary as to why that should be the case. So even some people who think there should be very strict safeguards, like palliative care physician Timothy Quill, has said that he doesn't really think that terminal illness is really should be interpreted as at least dead, dead within six months. There are people who are dying, even if they're not going to be dead within six months. So what are the arguments that are moral arguments in favor of letting people make this uh, decision. There's two very prominent ones, and then there's a third one that I'm going to mention as well. And the first one is the argument from suffering. Why should someone have to go through horrible suffering and unrelievable pain if they would prefer to die instead? And if we think that it is a, a charitable act to do for our pets to put them out of their misery, shouldn't human beings have the right to have the same thing done for them when they are suffering horribly? It just seems cruel. Sometimes it's called the arg argument from cruelty. A different argument is the argument from autonomy. And this says that, in general, people should be able to make the most important decisions about how their lives go, so long as they do not violate the rights of other people or harm other people. But when it's just about their own lives, the argument for autonomy says people have a really strong interest 
in making decisions about how their lives go and also about how their lives end. Very often, the two arguments go together. The reason why someone wants to die is that they are suffering, but they needn't go together. And one of the interesting things in Oregon is that people don't really mention physical suffering as a top reason why they want to die. They're more likely to say that their lives, uh, that they want to have control, or that it's a question of dignity, or that their lives are devoid of anything that would make them worth living and pleasurable. So even if you can control physical suffering, people sometimes don't want to end their lives the way they will end them if they just have a natural death. The third argument has to do with a kind of parity between the right to refuse treatment that uh, we were talking about earlier this, this afternoon. This is a well-accepted right in, in the United States and generally in common law. As Paul said, a battery if someone continues to treat you after you've refused treatment, even if it's life-sustaining, and even if the doctor thinks that you're being unreasonable about it. You have the right to refuse treatment. Well, so what some judges in the United States have said, so we got two groups of patients here, right? We got both of them are want to die, but one group has a treatment that could prolong their lives, and one doesn't. Group A, right, can refuse the treatment and die. Yippee, right? But group B, there's nothing for them to refuse, so they have to stay alive, even though they're suffering and would prefer to die. It seems kind of arbitrary <laughs> to say you have the right to refuse treatment if that will be uh, a way to achieve your death, but not a way to directly achieve uh, that goal. So that's sometimes been called the equal protection, that we shouldn't discriminate on an arbitrary basis between those who are lucky enough to have a treatment to refuse and those who are not so lucky. There are also, and those arguments, I think, are very strong and very persuasive. But there are also very strong arguments uh, against them. I'm not going to go through the ones that I think are not good arguments. I'll just mention them very briefly. Some people make religious arguments. You know, only God has the right to determine when someone dies. In a secular society, not everybody believes in God, and people have different religions. So public reason requires us to put those to one side as the basis, at least, for law. It may be a reason why some people would never choose uh, euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. But before we can impose a restriction on everyone, it has to be something that people could see as reasonable. One argument is made has to do with the notion of physician responsibility, and that is that doctors are supposed to be healers, not killers. If we legalize euthanasia, the patient would not know if the doctor coming down the hall was coming to treat or kill, right? So it might cause a loss of trust uh, in uh, physicians. Second argument that's sometimes given is to say we shouldn't, you know, if, if you can no longer heal your patient, then what you have to do is move to comfort care, palliative care, hospice. But if there's this option of killing the patient, well, that would be quicker and cheaper, and, and therefore, people would be motivated to choose that. And therefore, the very existence of PAD as a legal option would undermine palliative care. A third argument is given is that, is this really a choice that we want to offer people who are gravely ill, right? Because mightn't they feel that it's selfish of them to go on living when they have this legal option, right? Why are we, they might think, gee, my family is spending money, the society is spending money, my family is burdened by having to come visit me, maybe I'm being cowardly by not taking uh, the way out. And so the argument here is that maybe we'll be going from killing people who are in pain 
to killing people who are a pain, a burden. Right. And that brings me to the, the slippery slope argument. Slippery slope arguments, in general, have the following form. We start with something that seems perfectly reasonable, and then, step by step, we get to something that most people would go, ah, that's not what we wanted. That's unreasonable. But there's no way, according to this argument, to prevent us going down this very slippery slope. So the most persuasive, perhaps, would be the suffering, terminally ill person who wants to die. But might we then move, as we've already seen in the Netherlands, to the uh, Alzheimer's patient who had an advanced directive? Might we move to infants? Uh, there was an article that I've just read recently about um, mentally ill people uh, might be suffering so much that even if they look, lack capacity to consent, maybe they should also be killed. Uh, what about those who are severely depressed? And will we get to a place where people will think, no, no, this is no longer uh, justifiable? And is there any way to prevent it? So one very well-known law professor who has made the case back in 1958, and I don't think the change, case has changed too much, against euthanasia was Yale Kamisar. And what he said is, we have to have a, a balance of how great is the need for euthanasia and how great is the risk of mistake or abuse. By mistake, he means maybe the person really was terminally ill. You know, some people who are diagnosed as terminally ill don't die within six months. They live for a year or two years, and some of them even go into remission and or get better, get something else kills them. Um, abuse might be uh, something like they don't really want to die, but they're getting some pressure from other people who think that their lives are just not worth it. I once saw a videotape about a woman whose husband had a very serious kind of cancer and he was in remission, and she said to the doctor, listen, uh, if he needs treatment again, I don't want him to have any treatment. And the doctor said, what? <laughs> he wants to live. And she said, yes, but I have two small children now. And if this goes on much longer, I'm going to have teenage sons, and no one is going to want to marry me. So we all know how this is going to end eventually. So OK, that's the kind of thing people are really scared about. Let me give uh, some responses. First of all, is it, part, is it part of the physician's role to help patients die? And some doctors have said, yeah, it is. Of course we're healers, but we can't always heal. And when our patients are dying, and this is what they want because they are suffering, whether it's from physical pain or emotional suffering, and we should be there to help them have a good death. As long as it's what the patient really wants, why should there be any lack of trust? Indeed, there might be more trust that you are not going to be abandoned in, in your dying process. What about palliative care? Well, many people have argued that there's no inconsistency between physician-assisted death and, and palliative care and indeed, uh, the data from Oregon suggests that legalizing aid in dying may actually have improved palliative care, because part of the legislation is that doctors are required to tell their patients who request uh, aid in dying about palliative care, which they weren't required to do before. Many of them didn't even know that much about it. So some people at least have argued that as doctors have become more familiar with palliative care, and they're required to talk with their patients about palliative care, palliative care is actually improved in Oregon. As far as imposing a burden on gravely ill people, well, it could be argued that not having that choice 
may be a greater burden. And I will also point out that not everybody who asks for the pills in Oregon actually uses them. Many people just want the security of knowing that if it gets too bad, they have a way out. They don't necessarily use it after all. And as far as the slippery slope goes, what we really have to talk about is which are the outcomes that we think would be impermissible and then put into effect um, safeguards and restrictions to prevent them from occurring. So I said that Camisar does this as kind of a utilitarian analysis. How great is the need? and uh, what is the risk of uh, mistake uh, and uh, abuse. Those who are opposed to physician-assisted death argue that the dangers of legalization are just too great. And they also say, look, it's not like physicians don't already help their patients to die. They do. They just don't do it openly and overtly. Sometimes they might say, are you having trouble sleeping? Here's some pills that will help you sleep. But don't take 20, because that would kill you. Right? OK. Um, so they would rather do it under the table. They're afraid that legalizing it would open the floodgates. Some people in the palliative care industry, if we can call it that way, say, we don't need this. There is no suffering that cannot be alleviated uh, uh, that cannot be alleviated. Palliative care can also do it. And so instead of trying to pass legislation to make physician-assisted death um, available, instead we should be working hard to make sure that all people have access, access to excellent medical care, and that includes palliative care. And not just at the end of life, by the way. Palliative care is a good thing even if you're not dying. And then some people have said, and after we have that, then we'll talk about euthanasia. But it is premature to talk about a right to die when not everybody has a right to health care. Uh, and I mentioned this one already. And it's also, they say, you know, it's interesting that although doctors do help their patients to die, uh, not one has ever been uh, convicted of criminal homicide. And even in the famous case of Timothy Quill in the United States, where he did help his patient to die uh, by writing her a prescription for barbiturates, knowing what she was going to do with them. And then he wrote it up as an article, which was in the, uh, was it JAMA or New England Journal? Do you remember? JAMA, I think. Anyway, he wrote it up. And he w went before a grand jury. But they eventually just drop the whole thing, you know. So certainly if you don't write it up in a position, <laughs> a journal, you're probably not going to get indicted. OK. So aid in dying has been legal in Oregon since 1994. And every year they do very extensive data collection about how many people request it, how many people die from the lethal injections, and, and lots and lots of information, which is all on their, their website. And there is general agreement that there hasn't been uh, instances of mistakes or, or, or abuse or a, um, a slippery slope. Uh, not everybody agrees with that, but I would say that that is the consensus, that we just haven't seen it. Now, it may be that Oregon is different and that Oregon is different from New York, say, much less Hong Kong. It would be very interesting. Some people have also said that the Netherlands is different because there you have a family doctor who lives in the neighborhood and makes house calls. That's a very different situation from a big city in the US where people don't have those kinds of relationships. Palliative care. Um, palliative care is very, very important, but it may, it is not a panacea, and it may not be relevant. In the uh, recent and quite well-covered case of uh, Brittany Menard, who was a uh, young California uh, woman who had just gotten married, was looking forward to having children, and had a horrible brain cancer, 
Um, she, because she was living in California, which had not passed um, aid and dying, uh, she wanted it because although she was told she could get palliative care to take care of her physical suffering, she knew that she was going to uh, lose significant cognitive function, she would lose physical function, and basically it was just not the way she wanted to end her life. So she uprooted both her parents and her husband, and they moved to Oregon. Um, and she became a real, before she died, a real advocate for uh, aid in dying, and I think she's probably single-handedly been the individual most responsible for it being passed in California. As for whether doctors should do it under the table, some people say, why would that be safer? It's safer to have a sunshine, you know, have it out in the open, know what's legal and what is not legal, and have the restrictions to make sure that it's not just one doctor uh, taking it all upon himself or herself. And even if there haven't been any criminal con convictions of doctors helping their patients to die, uh, some doctors and nurses have faced criminal charges, and even for palliative care. One of our uh, friends has written a, uh, a book about this called, he's a psychiatrist and involved in uh, palliative care, and he's written a book called No Good Deed uh, about that. So having done this very quick romp through <laughs> physician-assisted death, I'm going to suggest some of my own conclusions. Obviously, you don't have to uh, take them as gospel or agree with them. I think that people have a prima facie right to make their own medical decisions, including when their lives should end. And certainly, the religious and uh, moral objections of some should not limit the liberty of others. At the same time, Society has an obligation to protect individuals from being killed against their will or being coerced to choose death. So legal safeguards are necessary. It's a much bigger question to say which ones. I personally think that uh, the drawing of a sharp line between aid and dying and euthanasia does not make sense because it arbitrarily rules out people who are paralyzed or who can't swallow. I'm also persuaded that terminal illness is not really the important thing because people can have terrible illnesses that cause terrible suffering without being terminally ill. Uh, more interesting are questions about whether it should be expanded to include psychiatric illness. Um, um, that's a project I'm working on now. And then an even greater question would be, what about someone who has no psychiatric illness, but who feels that he's lived long enough and is now tired of life? That is possible to get euthanasia in such cases uh, in the Netherlands and in, uh, in uh, Belgium. It's rare, but it is possible, and some regard that as evidence of a very slippery and very dangerous slope. So that's an issue that needs to be explored. I think it's really important that whether it's for so-called existential suffering, being tired of life, or psychiatric illness, or physical illness, or terminal illness, physician-assisted death should be a last resort, not a first resort. And it should never be done to save money or to relieve families of uh, a burden. Um, and even although I think people should have the right to make this decision, I think as a society we also need to make sure it's, it may be something that people should have, but it certainly is not sufficient. We need to ensure that everyone has adequate health care and access to adequate health care, including palliative care. And we also need something that I think uh, Maybe you have more here in Hong Kong than we do often in the United States, namely a culture of caring for the old and the sick. Without that, this would just become, I think, very dangerous indeed. Thank you.
Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I, I would like to know if the decision to withdraw or withhold treatment can be made on the basis that to save money or to really burden the family, why we couldn't make the same decision on the, uh, for the PAD? Thank oh, you. that's a very good question. Did everybody get that? He said people might make the decision not to uh, undergo treatment because it's, they think it's too expensive and too burdensome on the family, so why, why not let them also make the decision uh, for uh, euthanasia? Um, I think, ideally, I would not want people to make the decision for withdrawing or withholding treatment either on the basis that it is it costs too much. But because treatment inflicted on someone who is resisting it is a physical battery on that person's body, it seems to me different from providing someone with the assistance of a physician. So therefore, I don't think we can say to people, why, ask them why they're refusing treatment, and say, no, no, you don't get to refuse it. But I think we can do that with something like uh, euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. But I will also say that I think that if we made sure that everybody had access to adequate medical care, there would be fewer people saying it's too expensive. There might be some, but there would be fewer. Just a quick follow-up to that, but the burdens people are often worried about the most are not financial to their family. The burdens are the burdens of the disruption of their lives by caregiving and attention, even if there's a facility in which they're being cared for. So um, how do you block that slide? Well, you know, Felicia Nimue Ackerman has a response to that. So Paul's question is, what if it's not a financial burden? What if it's the burden of caring for the person? And what um, Ackerman says is, either your family loves you and wants you to live if you want to live and take care of you to enable it, or they don't. If they do, then it's not a burden. If they don't, why are you caring about them? <laughs> and I have to say, I think that's a pretty good response. <laughs> Thank you. I just uh, wanted to you know, ask a further question. It's really about values. Uh, what kind of social values or personal values, family values, really think that is most important. Uh, I think what you put here that uh, you give certain social values before the judgment. So if that is right according to the social values, you think personal uh, physician assisting, assisted death or the euthanasia should be, can be given in that circumstances. But at the same time, you give an individual or a family a choice based on their own values. So that would lead to some kind of conflict in some extreme cases. For example, like a person is not liked by the family or the person is so much kind of uh, uh, altruism, trying to give away his or her uh, sufferings or values or priority to either members of the family. So I, I think that we'll probably end up with lots of kind of extreme cases we cannot judge. I think the background of not legalizing the urination in many countries that uh, uh, we need to protect a person's right to live. So uh, I think to me it's very confusing, I think to others might, uh, might be as well. I'm not sure I quite followed all of that. Are you saying that if the family doesn't like the dying person or the very sick person very much, they might try to influence the person? Is that the what gist I'm of you? What I'm saying is that uh, 
we we have this <coughs> kind of uh, judgment of, of whether Euro uh, euthanasia can be given or not based on some social values. But also we give the freedom for the individual or family to judge based on their own values. Well, why, so when they're getting well, how the does the family get involved? Because for example, normally these kind of decisions would be very hard within the families. And you would get uh, one voice versus another. Right. Of course you have that with treatment as well, don't you? Right? And uh, they, they often refer to it in the United States. I don't know if you have a comparable uh, expression here about the, um, what is it, the brother-in-law from, from New Jersey flies in or something and says, wait a minute, I want everything done. Or the person who feels guilty or something. So I don't think it's unique to this. I really don't. Uh, again, the, I don't have the figures right in front of me, and I don't know if you remember them, Paul, but the, the number of people or the percentage of people in Oregon who die every year by aid and dying is very small. It's, you know, it's tiny. So some people will say, well, then doesn't that show that we don't really need it? I, I don't think it does show that. I think it, what it gives people is a security that if they need it, it's going to be there for them. And that's, I think, the social value of it. Thank you very much for that really interesting talk. Um, you've given us some arguments for and against um, PAD. Um, I just wondered specifically what are the doctors, what are their views and what's the argument, you know, or the discussions doctors are having because they're the people who, you know, are actively participating in this. And if it's, you know, whether, you know, perhaps if it is legalized, what, what I'm sure there are a lot of concerns for the doctors, uh, if that's... Well, in, in most states, the medical societies have not given their approval, ex and the exception, and the only exception, I think, is in the United States is California, where the California Medical Association first dropped its objections and then actually supported it. But I should say also that in no state are doctors required to participate. Um, and in that way, it's kind of like abortion, right? So if you as a doctor feel that you could not help anyone to die, then your obligation would be to refer, to tell the patient, I have to refer you to someone else who, who, who could be. But I would guess doctors are all over the map, just as the general uh, public uh, is about this. And many of them feel that they would want it for themselves, but they don't want to participate in making it legal. Whether that's cautious or hypocritical, I leave it to you to decide. What if, in a particular society, although, given your arguments, people should not distrust physicians because it is legal for them to assist a person in dying, they just don't have enough trust in physicians to prevent themselves from being more distrustful when physicians get this power even if it's a power that is at the beckoning of the patient. Don't we have a, real, a social reality to deal with? And if that reality is just a pretty stubborn fragility of, about the trust in which people hold positions, that is, they do, they are suspicious of, as in certain subgroups in the United States they're suspicious of, then shouldn't we just wait don't we have to wait until that trust is established before we legalize well, the PAS? Um, I don't have any problem with waiting. I will say, however, that those who have claimed that it would have adversely affect trust, to my knowledge, have never given any empirical data. It's purely speculative. 
But you are certainly right that in the United States, for example, we talked about advanced directives. One subgroup that does not tend to make advanced directives are African Americans, because they don't trust the medical establishment. And, and they're afraid that if they do anything like that, they will be used as guinea pigs, their organs will be taken. I mean, they're nervous about this. And they tend not to support physician-assisted death. And one of the differences in Oregon is that Oregon is overwhelmingly white, 94% white, I think. It's got very few minorities. So I, I originally was on the side of saying that it hadn't been proven that the uh, risk of mistake and abuse outweighed the need. And I changed my mind largely because the data from Oregon seems to support it. But if someone were to come up with data from New York or Mississippi or something that showed something completely different, I would, I would say, right, these are largely empirical claims, not absolute right claims, because the right of individuals to make decisions about their own lives has to be balanced against the needs of society to protect the vulnerable. I see I've stunned the rest of you into silence. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering if there are any rules to determine when the timing of the um, PAD um, would be given. So would you be allowed to give it when the suffering has already established or if the suffering is anticipated? So, but then on the other side, you could say that if it's anticipated, but sometimes it's difficult to predict what would actually happen. So um, are there any rules to that? And what are the moral um, implications of that? Well, in... Um Oregon and Washington and Vermont and California now, uh, suffering isn't actually mentioned. It's terminal illness and voluntariness. But certainly in order to ascertain that the, result, that the request is a voluntary one, you, the doctor is supposed to make sure that the patient is aware of other ways to treat things. Look, what no one wants is a patient who says, you know, I don't feel so well, doc. Could I have euthanasia? <laughs> so that was the whole reason for terminal illness. It's supposed to be the patient's dying anyway, right? And so the only question is, what, what can we do? But you bring up, I think, a point that is a, a very good one that Yale Kamisar brought up in his classic 1958 article. What he said was, if someone is in extreme pain, are you going to give them euthanasia then? Because how do you know it's not the pain talking? You say, oh, OK, right, right. We don't want to do that. We'll give him some morphine so he doesn't feel so much pain. He goes, OK, so now you're going to do it while he's doped up? Is that a, a voluntary request? Oh, no, no, no. We don't want to do that. Let's take him off the morphine and then see if he still requests it. OK, now the pain is really bad because you've taken him off the morphine. So Yale Kamisar said, how are you supposed to balance these things? I don't think you can do it. I don't think it's necessarily that bad, but I think you raise an important point, which is at what point are we, are, are we going to do this? I think that's part of the reason for the two-week wait between requests in, in Oregon and the other states in the US. You have to request in writing, wait two weeks. Presumably during that time, you're getting palliative care and everything else, and you may decide you don't want it. Or as I said, people may get the prescription and never use it. Right. Professor Steinbach, could you please comment on Robin Williams' suicide case? For example, was he influenced by prescription drugs, lack of access to physician-assisted suicide or aid in dying, thank you very much, and a heart. <laughs> it's very sweet. Uh, I don't know a lot. I mean, I, I look on Facebook, so I, I know what people are saying about Robin Williams. His wife is now saying that he had Louis uh, dementia and that that was the, the real uh, cause of it. 
Um, of course, he couldn't have gotten aid in dying. I think he lived in California, I think, right? But anyway, it wasn't legalized then. And he wasn't terminally ill, so he wouldn't have been a candidate in the United States. Uh, what if he'd gone to, he could have gone to Switzerland, I suppose, and gotten assisted suicide there? Or he could perhaps, I don't know what the uh, residency requirements are for moving to Belgium or the Netherlands. I, I, I haven't heard about that, so I, I think they must be pretty, pretty severe. But he was able to kill himself. And some people say, why should doctors get involved in killing people who are capable of killing themselves? I mean, someone who is terminally ill and very weak, you know, may not have the ability. He, he hanged himself, I believe. So, um, but I think the reason why some people who would be considering suicide who are severely depressed would be would prefer the help of a doctor is just to make it more secure and not to end up in a worse condition than you already were. You know, you jump out of a window and you end up paraplegic instead of dead, right, or something like that. And if you have guns, which many people in the United States seem to have access to, it's a very messy way to die and not really so nice for the survivors. So that would be an argument there. But with the Robin Williams case, I think the, he was clearly depressed the question is whether he had other options. I'm not in a, a position um, to say anything about that. Most people have other options, but maybe not all. Hi. Um, I'm just curious, in the countries that have approved them um, a legal way to die. Uh, what are the samples or the kind of abuses that have been seen? And basically, how is abuse measured? Like, does it mean you do not fulfill the conditions, such as the two-week wait? And, or are there other ways when you investigate cases of abuse that investigators look at? Thank you. Very good question. Um, I don't think there have been many cases of abuse of the sort of not f uh, fulfilling the criteria. What some people, so it's how do you define abuse? <laughs> and as I said, in the Netherlands, they, as the result of certain cases, uh, have expanded uh, the eligibility for um, being helped to die. So originally, doctors thought that you couldn't help a patient who was uh, in severe dementia and no longer competent to die. They interpreted voluntariness in the same way that it's interpreted in the United States, namely contemporary competence. But after the case that we wrote about, where the doctor helped his patient to die, it then went through about five different committees. And the Royal Medical, uh, the Dutch Royal Medical Society uh, came out with a statement saying, the law is fulfilled if someone has requested it while competent by advanced directive to avoid uh, ending her life in severe dementia. Similarly, the, the uh, use of euthanasia in the case of unbearable suffering that can't be ameliorated any way, other way for, for infants. Um, similarly, for those who um, have severe treatment-resistant depression, and similarly, for the few cases in which it has been done for someone who has no psychiatric illness but is tired of life. So are those abuses or are those reasonable extensions of the law? That's, that's the fundamental question. I'd, I'd like just to add one more point about the, uh, the arguments against uh, euthanasia. I, uh, you have given us all the very good reasons both for and, and against. I just want to point out that one group 
of people who are strongly opposing legalizing euthanasia are those patients who are themselves chronically disabled. So, so, so people were we saying that, well, legalizing euthanasia will help those who are ill and suffering. But then actually, one of the very strong op opponents of euthanizing, uh, 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 legalizing euthanasia are those, include those who are chronically ill and disabled. The one important reason to say is that if this is legalized, he or she and her whole group had, would have died. So that's very, very simple and very... Uh, very important point. I just will add that um, there is not unanimity among the disabled about this. But you're certainly right that groups like Not Dead Yet have said you legalize this and will be the first to be targeted. But there are some others who say the mere fact that I'm disabled doesn't mean that I should be deprived of my right to make my own decisions. And they certainly want the right to be able to refuse um, medical treatment, including life-saving treatment, if that's what they want. So then the argument from equal protection comes in, well, why shouldn't they have this right as well? But I guess it really depends on whether you think it will be used to help people or to hurt them. Anyone else? Um, I, I just want to mention one, one case in Hong Kong. Um, a few years ago, there, there was a bunny, right? A bun uh, in, in Hong Kong, and then he was uh, paralyzed for more than 20 years. And then he wrote a letter to our former chief executive, uh, Tung Chi Wa, and then saying that he wants to die. And, and in the end, he, there was a book published and then uh, uh, related to euthanasia in Hong Kong. Uh, at, at that time, there was some, some argument uh, in the Legislative Council. Uh, there's one Legislative Councilor, uh, Lo Wen Lok, uh, he is already dead right? <laughs> a, a few months ago. And he, 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 he once mentioned that those asking for euthanasia, they're not asking for death. They are asking for assistance. Uh, how, how, do, how do you take that uh, statement? Uh, uh. Well, I think some probably are, but I think somebody like Brittany Menard was certainly not. I mean, she had excellent palliative care available to her, and she didn't think that that was going to solve her problem. She did not want to become, you know, completely cognitively and physically disabled before she finally died. That's just not what she wanted to do. So I think that's why I say it's a last resort and you have to give people the help they really want, not just say, oh, this solves everything. No, it doesn't. Sorry, this will be again. Because I, I just want to respond to the, the, uh, uh, the topic about uh, Banzai, is the, the, the paraplegic, uh, the quad, quadriplegic patient who requested euthanasia. I would like to add to that. At the time, after he has requested euthanasia, of course, it's turned down because it's not legal in Hong Kong. What happened was that there was a lot of much better support, both uh, uh, tangible and intangible, towards him. And with those support, he actually, with the help of a computer, he wrote a, a big book on I want euthanasia, asking for legalizing euthanasia in Hong Kong. But within that book, he mentioned that I have now changed my mind. I, I want euthanasia legalized in Hong Kong, but I do not want to die now. So I, I think this is a very important message for other people. If euthanasia was legal, at the time when he wrote the request, he, would, he might have already been uh, uh, dead. But that, because it was not legalized, resource, a lot of resource was, uh, uh, went to help him. In, though he maintained his view that euthanasia should be legalized, at that he changed, actually changed his mind and said that he had to, I don't want to die at this moment, but I still want to have my right legalized so that I can die later when I want to die. But anyway, I, I think this is an uh, right. important lesson. And of course, if you limit it to people who are going to be uh, allegedly, anyway, dead within six months, you avoid that sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Anything else? Well, thank you very much then.